And now, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. We made it to October 23rd. Yes. And we're Beautiful talking day. about Smelter Town in uh, West El Paso. And am I on here? I think I am testing one, oh. two, three. Oh, there I am. I had to just tappy tappy that thing there. We're live on KTSM AM 690 in El Paso and TV streaming live on our YouTube channel now and on our Facebook page, El Paso History Radio Show, if the Facebook gods are willing. And streaming live on Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When. And this is the place where we say Texas history begins in El Paso. So what do you got, Melissa? Well, I'm glad to be back. Sorry about last week and didn't get to be here for the show, but uh, we had a good time down in Galveston with the Texas Historical Foundation. Neat people down there. Got uh, to, yeah, got to visit the Alyssa ship, which is an old ship from the Civil War. So you guys get around. Yeah, it was fun. It was good. It was a great time to go down there. And so also I want people to know that they can also listen to us via, stre- uh, via streaming live on the Internet via KTSMRadioTalk.com where you'll be connected automatically to iHeartRadio and you can listen to the show anywhere there is internet service. Do you happen to have a history moment? Yes, I do. And it's about the residents of Skull Canyon near uh, Smelter Town. Otherwise known as Calavera. Oh, yeah, don't give it away. Well, I, oh, I see. Don't give it away. Okay. <laughs> Just a, a quick note no, about... No, where's Skull Canyon? A quick note about last week's radio show. It was a convergence of events. I wasn't feeling well. And Melissa was out of town. And our scheduled guest had told me originally... She would rather do this in January, but she could do it. So I got to thinking, well, it's just sub a show. And that's basically what happened. So we're going to do the Chinese history uh, of El Paso, which Ana Fehi can do very well. She's very versed in that. And that show will come up in January. So that is when we decided to substitute the War Eagles program. Now, today we have people on the radio, one of them named Ruben Escandon. How are you, sir? Good morning. I am here. Hey, you're, Ruben. You're surviving by phone. And also, by phone. By Roberto Salas, your sidekick in crime, yeah. uh, he's here in the studio. Good, Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here. Well, welcome here, dude. Uh, basically, Ruben and, and uh, Roberto, what I want to do today, if we can, is take sort of an inside look, which you guys both know all about, the history of Smelter Town and Asarco. And we did have to cancel the pilgrimage this year in Mount Cristo Rey. And also, we asked David Etzel to call in. He's the agent. Uh, for the property, it is for sale. If you have too much money, he'll take it and give you the whole darn thing. Or we'll, we'll ask him what he'll do about it. So, uh, Ruben, I, I know you're on the El Paso, uh, the uh, Cristo Rey Restoration Committee. What what other uh, credentials would you like to present today? Well, as far as the as far as the cancellation, I think that's the biggest thing that people are are questioning as to why. And uh, the only thing I can tell you is that you know we lost our our president of the association uh, in March, uh, Toto Bustillos was the president of our committee and he contracted um, COVID. And of course he was in the hospital for about a month and, and didn't make it. And everybody's still spooked, you know, the volunteers. So nobody really, I can't get volunteers to work it. And, and, you know, unfortunately the diocese said, no, if you can't get them, we're not going to take a chance and canceled it. So that's pretty much it. And Roberto, you are also part of the committee. Yes. But what other credentials would you like to tell us? Well, I'm an artist and a uh, visual artist, and I have done um, restoration uh, a little bit on the Mount Cristo Rey, erased graffiti, made it blended in like uh, regular rock <laughs> with a little bit of paint, so it's not so obvious. But you have other projects you're doing now. Oh, yes, sir. I uh, I do art in public places, a few commissions here and there that I do. I well, you got some guy, what, in San Diego and also yeah, in L.A. I coming have, up? I have two in San Diego and one in Los Angeles. One is an animal cool. shelter. Oh, the other, really? The other two is uh, right in the port of San Diego, which is a very oh, big project. That's very it's cool. Very, very. Nice. Get much closer to that. That, that thing seems if it tends to fall down. Oh, it's a little better. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also, <laughs> watch this. Watch this. That uh, goes on the radio, so be careful. Okay. I'm not banging on the table. But, well, the, uh, the whole thing about uh, the inside look, um, Ruben, you grew up in Calavera, so you knew quite well uh, how things were going in, in Smelter Town. And Asarco. What is your take on the history of that that whole area? We're going to ask Melissa later on to do the early history of the smelter itself, and some on uh, some on uh, uh, Smelter Town itself. But you grew up there, so what was it like? You were you were a kid and you saw the smelter operations every day, right? You know, living there at the base of the smokestack, pretty much in the Calavera. Um, you know, you got to see the you know, the ins and outs of, of everyday life there. And it was a different type of life, very laid back, very, 
you know, uh, you know, you had no worries. You know, as kids, we were out there running all over the place, and we'd even play up there in the slag pits. And oh my, you know, and yeah, unfortunately, you know that that was, uh, you know, we didn't know any better. And of course, you know, we continued playing up there and and doing that. But life is you know, just different, you know. And and the, the, there was a division between Smelter Town and La Calavera, you know. So, you know, people that uh, that that lived in Smelter Town, you know, we'd always have. I guess a, a healthy competition with sports and, ah. you know, we softball in the street and football in the street and stuff like that. But there was, there was a, a community, a sense of community that was always there. And I think that's, that's the, the important thing to take away from that, that it was a, a, a family oriented, you know, community and, and, you know, people that lived there, a lot of them were related, you know, so we have a lot of people that, uh, that were related, the same families and there's, you know, different generations of families that, that of course, uh, grew up there. So it's, it's interesting to see now, you know, that, uh, it's gone, that people still get together and people still want to continue, you know, the, um, traditions that they had in that area. So you, uh, your whole, uh, smelter town, historical crowd of people that knew each other back when get together a couple times a year. They do. They do. We have, uh, of course, now with the pandemic, we didn't, we haven't had it, but this year, uh, it's scheduled for, uh, for, I believe it's in November, if I'm not mistaken, but they're uh, we're planning a reunion dance again. Um, and every year we had a we had the golf tournament in August. That one did go through, and uh, and then the uh, reunion dance is coming up. So you know because of the pandemic, it it, it so we skipped a year, but uh, but that was the whole thing. You know that uh, the people still come out. They they you know they uh, support the church there in, in Buena Vista actually because that was where a lot of the people moved to after they you know, tore down uh, smelter town. Well, you're talking about the church that was down in the uh, lower area, I guess referred to El Bajo, right? Yes. No, the one up in the one in Buena Vista, the one in Buena Vista is up there a little further up. And, and that was a church that now still stands and, and they, they sponsor a bazaar every year during this period. So normally it's a three day event that they, uh, that the, the people get together for a reunion. It's the golf tournament. And the next day is the dance. And then on Sunday is the bazaar. Oh, great. Well, let's go out of order here. You got a question? Well, yeah, you were talking about, did you want to know about the original church that was in Smelter Town, the name or? Uh, the, up on the hill? No, this was down down in Smelter Town. Well, let's start with the earlier one. Andrew's got a couple of pictures okay. of that. And there was a, a very old uh, church, a picture from 1925. And uh, that church sits on the side of the hill. Because originally, let's talk about that just briefly. Originally, the... Um, the whole, all the workers lived up in among the, uh, the slag area and the ore area and they had to move them out. There was a little Mexican village up in there. Yeah. That was what the, the Mexican employees built up in there, kind of like as a squatters type group up there. Well, the thing is that, and, and the smelter thought that was just great. They had, oh, yeah. they had their supervisors on site and they, they, that place ran 24 seven. Oh yeah. And they had a medical service there as well. So. Yeah. And so back in the day, but there's also another tighter shot of that church. And today you can still see the uh, the remains of the foundation of that church as you drive down Donovan. And uh, that it just got crowded off. The smelter kept saying, okay, we're moving this. Okay, this is leaving, yada, yada. And uh, maybe uh, uh, you, you never knew, of course, you, neither you guys ever knew uh, the Padre that was there. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. You, yes did indeed. you know Lourdes, Lourdes, Lourdes Costa? Yes, indeed. You yeah. did? Yes, he actually married my older sister, and he visited our house. And when my father built that house, when they tore down the adobe, which was the uh, highway, uh, eminent domain, <clears throat> dislocation, my father built, my father built a house up in the lot, and, and Father Lewis came and blessed the house, did a blessing. And then he married my sister shortly after that. Well, as a priest, clarify that. I'm sorry? The guy was a priest. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't marry her. Oh, yeah. No, no, he didn't marry her. He, <laughs> oh, no, he no. married them. <laughs> he okay. performed the wedding. And just yeah. the way it sounded yeah. like, yeah, what was that all about? <laughs> no, the whole, uh, the whole thing about Smelter Town, he pretty much glued that place together. Absolutely. He was the one that had the, uh, as, as it's quoted by uh, Ms. Perales, he ruled with an iron fist. Talk about her for a minute, because she wrote a book on this after the fact, sort of. Yes, yes, she uh, actually was a resident of Buena Vista, went to school, studied, became a PhD, and now she teaches at the University of Houston. But uh, she actually wrote this book, did a lot of research, and a lot of interesting things came through in that. And 
Talk about that for a minute. Well, you know, one of the things about the, the beginning of a solder code, it's at the crossroads of the two railroads that go east and west and uh, north and south. And all along through the south, there are mines that have been mined, but people were recruited from Mexico, and the whole village would come and work at Asarco. Uh, and so that's why we have a lot of family clans connected at, to us of today, because these families did come from Mexico, the whole entire village, yeah. and it was well, employment. Most of them came, it was looking at the name of the first church, it was there was from a Chihuahuan town by the name of Santa, San Rosiala. Rosalia. Rosalia. Rosalia, Rosalia, yes. Rosalia right. Yeah, well, that was where most of those people came from initially. What was that, Ruben? Santa Rosalia was the church. Oh, Santa. Santa. I had San. Yo, so that's the right. one that was down in, in the riverbed, basically. Mm -hmm. and the, the, no, that's a, that was the one on top. Oh, that was the one up on the top. Yeah, that oh, that was up on the top? Okay. That was the one at the top. Santa Rosalia was the one that, that was at the top. It was amazing how Asarco just generally pushed the people off the top. They were living there. They were working there. There were four major big houses that the uh, the major managers lived there on site. Yes, I believe so. Right. About, do you ever see any? Do you ever see any of that? Uh, as of late, when last few years, last ten years, that's when I actually saw that and witnessed that. There was also the vocational school, and I believe my mother was uh, a participant in that. Well, Dean, I'm talking about four big houses that were constructed out of wood by the by the carpenter shop of a Sarko. And the four major managers lived in there. Dr. Schuster lived there also. He was in one yeah, of Yeah, he them? was because they had the hospital. That's what brought Eugenia and uh, her husband. I can't remember his name, Charles, I think. Uh, Dr. Schuster from Hungary. They were brought in to be their uh, hospital people. They had a hospital and a home. Well, for my, I, I was told uh, when we were going through uh, after the fact, uh, I, I got in there basically as the bankruptcy occurred. The trustee said, yeah, you want to come in and look this place over with a camera? Go for it. So that's Ruben and I were on, on the crew re regularly to go do that. But what we found and heard from the people there is that we had, uh, there were five like major arroyos that fed through that site and they blocked them all off. Some of them, they turned into lakes and in front of one of the, the lake was in front of one set of four, these four huge houses, wooden houses. And they, they obviously went, uh, cause to, to, to look at the land afterwards when it, the, the smelter just turned off. It was an amazing place already, but that, that whole piece of property had transformed constantly mm. from what it was, um, basically an area with the, with the Royals. And, uh, and then all that history occurred there, but I want to, uh, uh, we should probably take a break now and come back in a minute and finish, finish a couple of these things up. Cause I want to talk on a, a number of things. Um, we've got, uh, the closed smelter to take a look at. Oh, the smokestack getting inside the smokestack. My goodness. That was a nutty day or two. Um, so anyway, we're going to take a break here and come back in a minute. And uh, I guess we're doing okay on the streaming, Andrew. We got, uh, in, and you got any thoughts on? Uh, uh, no, I was just going to uh, save it when we get to that point. That's very interesting information, though, about the peoples and such that live there. Fair enough. Should we take a break? Go ahead. Yeah, we got a, a, a Michelle Scheisser, Scheisser saying a good morning from uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Oh. Anyone remember driving to a point above the slag pile at night in order to watch the bright orange molten cascade slide down the hillside back in the 1960s? We teenagers sure must have been bored. Well, you had that picture up, but go ahead and throw that one back up for a second. And Ruben, we can hear you snorting it. I hope you're okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but the slag pour, yeah, look at this. Uh, this is insane. This went on all the time. I mean, that stuff obviously is molten hot, almost usable material, but it wasn't quite usable. So they just, they dumped it in the Arroyo. Yes. Sir. And it's I don't a spectacular know. Spectacular sight. I, oh, gosh. I, don't, I saw it once from the freeway. I don't know why it was called Parker Brothers. I don't know who they were. But, but that Parker Brothers Arroyo was totally, totally filled up with this stuff. And the bankruptcy trustee got enough money from the sale of the metal on the property to remediate that. Mm. And people yes. in El Paso don't really realize that's what he did. They were all yelling at him about keep the stacks up. Hey, we want to do all that. What he did was remediate that entire Arroyo. And he didn't have to do that. He could have just dug a hole and buried it. That's true. And so that whole Arroyo is now going to become usable again. The bike path and all that kind of stuff. All right. We'll talk more about that after the break. Let's throw the phone number out one time if somebody wants to talk. 915. 544-5876 or 915-544-KTSM. Here's the deal. When you combine State Farm Home and Auto Insurance... 
you save an average of $889. State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson is ready to help you combine home and auto and save here in El Paso. Call 915-581-0000 today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Average annual per household savings based on a 2019 national survey by State Farm of new policyholders who reported savings by switching to State Farm. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. Hey, El Paso and surrounding areas, are you ready for some savings? Ivan Ochoa, general manager from Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Fiat. Right now, we are paying top dollar for all trades, plus 0% financing for 72 months on several models. There's never been a better time to trade or upgrade for less. During Jeep Adventure Days, Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat will take any trade in any condition, regardless of make or model, car, truck, or SUV. We want it, even if you owe up to $10,000 more than your old car is worth, so you can drive home a new or certified pre-owned vehicle for less. Save thousands in interest with zero APR for 72 months. Plus, save thousands at the all-new Southern Park Dodge Certified Pre-Owned Super Center. Our inventory of cars, trucks, and SUVs has never been better. All military personnel and all first responders receive an additional discount. Thank you for your service. Southern Park Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, Ram, Fiat. We're buying a car. It's fun. At I-10 at Southern Park Drive or online at SouthernParkDodge.com. Estamos en tu esquina, El Paso. El Paso Strong. Includes factory rebate and dealer discount plus TTNL. Zero APR is thirteen seventy two per thousand finance. On select vehicles with approved credit. Offers not combined. El Paso Children's Hospital in invites experienced registered nurses and new nurse graduates to an open house job fair Thursday, October 28th from 4.30 to 8 p.m. Learn about their pediatric specialty clinics and how El Paso Children's Hospital are able to provide the region's highest level of pediatric care. Now offering sign-on bonuses of up to $20,000, relocation assistance, and more. Call 915-242-8680. El Paso Children's Hospital is an equal opportunity employer. El Paso Children's Hospital, this is our hospital. Listen to Kelvin. What he's about to say could change your life. I'm 6'2", and I was about 290, and I lost weight fast. I trimmed down, now I'm about 235. I'm probably at about, oh, 9, maybe 10% body fat. That's great. I lost probably at least 60 pounds in probably three and a half, four months. Color of my hair is coming back. Skin looks better. Um, obviously gaining muscle. My muscle mass is coming back. Thank you for providing an awesome product. Somebody who actually has and does what they say they will. That's awesome. That's great, Kelvin. Losing that belly fat in less than four months is outstanding. Since 2004, Andro 400 has been changing men's lives, like Kelvin, and can help you lose belly fat, gain energy, and improve your lifestyle. We guarantee it. Go to andro400.com for more true testimonials, before and after photos, and special discounts. Only available on andro400.com andro400.com news radio 690 ktsm and now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the el paso history show brought to you by patrick tuttle legacy real estate services 915-585-7777 Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive, by Monterey Asset Management, by Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping, by Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563, and by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. Here again, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. I want, to, I want to point out that we do have a, a YouTube page streaming live on there right now. It's called El Paso History TV. And the El Paso Gold DVDs that I produced for about 20 years, they are up there for free online to take a look at. They go from, I, I like mountains, so they had Legends of the Mountains, Gunfighters with the Six Guns folks, and then the also Waco Tanks, Mount Crystal Ray, a bunch of other stuff like that. There's a dozen of them. And that's one playlist. Another playlist is... Uh, the ABC7 KVIA TV series that we put on for about two years. That's on El Paso History TV uh, channel on YouTube. And that uh, that's the one where Bernie Sargent's wandering around doing stuff. And uh, we produced those for ABC7. They went online. Have you ever seen, one, seen any of those? I've seen a few of them, yes. And all, you can go see them all now. 
Oh, and they're sure. about, about three minute pieces right now. If you want to go take a look at uh, that, those 20 pieces will kind of cover a lot of the history of El Paso, which is kind of hard to do, frankly, because mm -hmm. the history of El Paso is so varied. It's vast, yes. Uh, and these are great because of the fact that I have um, encountered a lot of interest from people who have have connections with Smelter Town or El Paso and want to know a little bit more about it. You know, they always have questions. They want to know about it. Um, this is a great source, a wonderful source yeah. to be passed out for people to connect with it and learn about it. Send them to El Paso History TV on YouTube. And uh, we have comments all the time going on on there and new subscribers regularly. Here's a recent comment about the DVD uh, uh, now on YouTube channel for free. Ramundo Fierro said, thank you very much for the history of Mount Crystal Ray. The last time I had made it up to the top was in 1974. And so, you know, there's a lot of people who remember a lot of things about El Paso history. But, you know, getting there is half the fun. And understanding what it is is the other half. So, and, I, you know, I've, I've told the, every, every, every time I get a chance, we don't get taught our history in the public schools here. Oh, so. no. And that's what's what wrong with that picture. All right, Melissa, what you got? Oh, I just wanted to mention that we've got some exciting things coming up for Dia de los Muertos. going to be held at Concordia Cemetery, and that's November 6th from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And this is a one-day event featuring revelers dressed in traditional Mexican clothing with skulls painted on their face, altares, uh, which are decorated graves, face painters, tarot card readers, arts and crafts, and along with music and other entertainment. In fact, six guys of shady ladies will be on hand. I'll be darned. Yeah, we're going to die in the same cemetery we do all the time oh and you don't want to miss the mojiganda skeletons the stilt walkers they roam the cemetery how oh, they do that I they're not amazed. stilt walkers well i got told the secret no, you you yeah i was going well, okay never mind you don't <laughs> want to hear the secret no you could tell the secret i'm not i'm not gonna tell it <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead see people what i no okay uh, they're roaming the cemetery, fire dancers, storytelling, and of course, six guys, shady ladies. They'll do a gunfight, and there's actually something for the whole family. So come on out. It's only five dollars for everyone except children under six are free. And dress like Calacas or Catrinas and get into spirit. Oh yeah, there's a lot going on there. So we'll also talk about that uh, next week on the radio show, and basically have them explain what the heck are you people doing dancing in the graveyard? <laughs> and you know, El Paso does a lot of unusual things. There's one of them right there. Um, all right, Roberto Salas is in the studio here with us. We got uh, Ruben Escandone out there on the other end of a phone. Um, where were we? We were talking about all kinds of interesting stuff here. The the thing I wanted to take a look at maybe was the uh, the clothes smelter, uh, or even when it was. Oh, that's right. You saw it being uh, the stack being built. Yes, I went to uh, E.B. Jones uh, Elementary School there from the kindergarten all the way to the seventh grade. So during that time, the construction was happening. Helicopters flying over, you know. You never saw the picture that's up on, on Facebook now. Uh, I mean, that, that's an unusual view. See, Asarco was also very secretive. If you brought a camera on site, they would arrest you and, and, and take your camera. Oh, interesting. And they had signs posted everywhere. And we took some guys through after the fact when it was... Ruben, you remember we took uh, Hamilton Underwood across the bridge, across I-10? He said, I have never been across this bridge, and I worked here 30-some-odd. 30, right. 30 I remember that. Oh, that was nuts. Nobody went anywhere they weren't supposed to. And right. was it restricted. Was it right? Is, is my memory correct that they said basically they had color-coded uniforms or helmets or something, and they could see from a distance who should be where? I believe that's how yeah. they they ran the place. I think that's what he said that he that there were certain areas that that required a certain, I guess, security clearance for them to come in and and be in that area. And that's what he had said that there were. I don't remember if it was the hard hats or the or the or the uh, overall. Unit, yeah, the overall. Were, well, your father worked there, right? He he did. He only worked there for a, for a short time. He didn't work there very long. Um, you know, my grandfather on my dad's side also worked there, but you know, they they. They weren't there, you know, very long. But my grandfather, Roberto's father, uh, he worked there as well for a little bit. And then he, you know, that was it. So, Roberto, what do you hear from those stories of the old? Well, economically, it was one of the best jobs you could get, according to our, I guess, the livelihood of everybody was uh, much more sustainable. And they, uh, they encourage people to go in there. There are generations of generations, sons of sons, and working there. But it was tough work. It wasn't easy work. It was difficult work. And people would come Messy, by. dirty, dangerous. Oh, yeah. 
And you know what? I'll have to tell you a quick story. While I was in uh, in elementary school, my friend, uh, his last name was Palacios. He said, hey, my mother has a restaurant. And I said, here in, in Smelter Town? She says, yeah, you want to go? I said, sure. We go off for lunch in school. And it so happened that this lady would cook meals for the workers. In the oh, okay. So they'd come in their overalls and hard hats and everything and sit at this big giant table. And the lady had an incredible menu of great food, anything from soups to meats to Jeez. rice enchiladas. I mean, she had an incredible. And so that's how she would make her living. And people would come, the men would come and eat and then go back to work. It was kind of interesting. But it was interesting to hear their conversations of what they were talking. I was a small kid in elementary school. Oh, my But you heard it. But I heard it, yeah. It was really wonderful. (laughs) Fair enough. All right, we're going to take a break here and come back in a minute. We're kind of expecting to hear from David Etzel because he is the current representative of the property for sale. And uh, he'll tell us whatever he can about what's going on there. Uh, which, for, I, I want to poke something in here real quick sure. from Mark Howe. He's up in uh, Pueblo, Colorado now. He's a he's a listener, but also has been a guest on the show. He's actually looking to do a book through Texas Tech on Smelter Town to go even more detail and more stories. So if there's anybody who'd be interested, you know, to uh, contact, we'll we'll get that contact information later. But if they want to p- contribute to that book, that'll be one thing. Plus, he's great. also he's done. He was with the uh, the. International water, boundary, inter- body, yeah, water, water boundary. He knows a lot about Smelter Town. Did a lot of research on it. He's giving a speech in Portland this week on uh, Smelter Town. Oh, interesting! So cool. It, so you're getting a lot of exposure, even more so. And you can find him on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, directly through the Smelter Town page, I think itself. So. All right, taking a break. Coming back in just a moment. See you then. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. If you're a local business owner, you know how important it is to be here for your customers. State Farm agent Ralph Dickerson runs a small business in El Paso, too. And Ralph Dickerson's here to help you protect your small business. Give him a call, 915-581-0000, or come by his office, located at 497 North Wrestler, Suite A, right at the corner of Wrestler and Orizaba. Stop in today. Call 581-0000 or State Farm agent Ralph Dickerson. What's all the buzz about nasal irrigation and navage, navage, navage? And should I try it? Here's the science. Airborne germs invade through your nose. It's the body's air filter for trapping allergens and viruses. When your nose gets clogged, it's less effective and germs multiply. Eventually, your immune system can get overwhelmed and you get sick. Nasal irrigation is an effective, all-natural way to clean your nose. It's not a drug. It's more like plumbing. Saline goes in one nostril, around the back of the nose, and out the other nostril, flushing out mucus and germs. I'm Martin Hoke, and I invented Navage to make cleaning your nose easy. It's the world's only nose cleaner with powered suction. Navage pulls out the bad stuff so you can breathe better, sleep deeper, snore less, and feel healthier. At Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, Target, Bed Bath, and Walmart. Or go to Navage.com for a free gift with purchase. Over 2 million sold. Navage, N-A-V-A-G-E. Clean nose, healthy life. Last Halloween, a new podcast scared us all to the bone. Now, 13 Days of Halloween is back. Starting October 19th, you'll hear one story each night, ending on Halloween. And beware, this show is produced in cutting-edge 3D audio for a truly immersive, terrifying tale. Nothing comes out of these waters. Once it's gone. From iHeartRadio 3D Audio and Blumhouse Television, listen to 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. The October Muster Used Car Sales Event is on. Right now, it costs a Buick GMC. Yeah, it's going on right now. A sale so scary good that you'll scream. One owner trades, lease returns, and we've dug up some unique specimens just for you. Like this 2015 Mustang 24877, or this 2019 Toyota Tundra 58777, or wow, this 2020 Yukon Denali 461877. Financing through more than 20 banks and credit unions. Buy here, pay here, financing by La Casita. The October used car monster sales event is on right now at Casa Buick GMC. Montana Airway by the airport. 
I'm Larry Gelwitz, the getaway guru. Join me on the travel show every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. We talk all things travel, favorite places, how to travel more and pay less, secret hideaways, discount airline tickets and cruises, and the best travel deals on the planet. It's the travel show every Sunday evening, 7 p.m., right here on News Radio 690 KTSM. And I'll tell you where to go and how to get there. With confusion around vaccinations, masks, and public screenings, it's important to know the symptoms of COVID and its variants. Fever is the leading sign, so make sure you use an accurate thermometer for your family. Only the Exergen Temporal Scanner Thermometer has been proven accurate with more than 100 clinical studies. Non-contact thermometers have no clinical evidence behind them and cannot be relied on. Be vigilant and be accurate with Exergen. Learn more at exergen.com. Guys, on Talk It Agrees, it's finally time. Time to update our closets with new clothes we actually want to wear. Time to think about going back to the office or choosing a new way to work. Time to enjoy the best of fall, like long walks in the park and hot coffee on a brisk day. And that means it's time to look sharp and feel comfortable all day with Untuck It. Shirts designed to be worn on Tuck. Discover the perfect fitting shirt today at UntuckIt.com. Use promo code TIME for 20% off your first purchase at UntuckIt.com. Good Risings. The Good Risings podcast is a collection of six mini shows curated to give you a daily shot of inspiration, motivation, humor, relationship advice, and even astrology. You can choose to listen to one or all of the daily Good Risings offerings available on our feed. It's the perfect daily practice for anyone looking to lead a more intentional, mindful, and inspired life. Listen to the Good Risings podcast on the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. News Radio 690 KTSM El Paso. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. And by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. Here again, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. We're talking a lot of stories about Smeltertown, Crystal Ray, and uh, the Osarco mess that sort of like glued it all together. Because Smeltertown people wouldn't have been there without Osarco. And Mount Crystal Ray wouldn't have been built without those people. So it's a whole one thing. And we're trying to take a look at it kind of from the inside. We, I just heard an inside story here we'll get to in a minute. But I want to tell you also about some new additions to the celebration of our mountains calendar. They include and uh, celebrate Earth Science Day, basically the rest of the day at UTEP. And also there's a history of the Keystone Project, Wednesday, October 27th, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Or, yeah, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And uh, you can get a hold of Jim Talbert or go to uh, just Google Celebration of Our Mountains and you can find the information, 525 7364. We always like to point out our wonderful sponsors that help us with keep the show on the air, and that's Pepe's Restaurant, home of the one and only Margarita, located at 6761 Donovan Drive. You can call them at 877 2152 for your holiday party catering. Look for a, looking for a company to manage your rental properties? Then call Monterey Asset Management at 915 592 4549 or visit their website m1ep.com. Looking to sell, buy, or rent a home? Then you need uh, Patrick Tuttle, a top producing realtor with Caldwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. Give Patrick a call today at 915-588-1850. And another great sponsor is State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson. He's like a good neighbor, but with a better phone number. 915-581-0000. Call Ralph for a for all your insurance needs today. He's a good dude. Hey, uh, Roberto Salas is sitting here with us in the studio. We've got Ruben Escandon on the phone. And uh, I, you didn't hear this because you're not in the studio, Ruben. But there was a story just that went by about contraband. <laughs> Roberto, what was yes. that all about? Well, there was a lot of liquor that was coming across the border. And it would come to a certain distributor who would distribute. <laughs> I understand that the parents would send the kids with a little empty bottle and they would get it filled up. You're talking prohibition. 
Yes, yes, indeed. And so there was always a patrol, but, um, you know, I used to love to sit in the kitchen table and hear the elders talk about these stories. And this is how I have it. It's a secondhand story. But my mother told me that her and her sister one time were aware of the signal to allow the people to cross the river and come and deliver the actual liquor, whatever was coming across. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. And there you go. Now you can Don't fall me. out of that chair. <laughs> And so the signal was to light a match or two, and that gave them the okay that the coast was clear. Well, my mother and her sister, being little delinquents, they did the signal. <laughs> oh, you and mean uh, I, and across from Smelter Town to unnecessarily? Yes, exactly. They knew about it and they just did it, you know. And so it, she said that after a while, there was this whole gun firing going on because they were exposed. The oh, signal no. wasn't an okay. So the following day, I think one of the head honchos from the contraband came over to my grandfather and said, hey, um, I think your kids were playing around here and it caused some problems. So <laughs> they got reprimanded pretty bad. But it was, it was just things that were going on, you know, that was just, I guess it was exciting for everybody else. But yeah, but, my mother, yeah. the troublemaker. <laughs> Let, let's talk, go back and talk for a minute about the construction of the, uh, of the, the, basically the big smokestack we we already had the picture but we'll, we'll show it again start with the oh three and that'll be the big the big stack itself that thing was an icon for a century obviously everybody who drove on the freeway or that side of town or lived over there knew that as an icon and so many people were saying the day that thing came down changed my world and it wasn't like it was so personal but it was how did how did you feel about that? Well, it was a love hate relationship because being under that smokestack, you know, it was very hard to be there with the soot and the actual uh, smell. Uh, you'd be out there playing in the playground, and oh, you'd be hoarse by the time you came in for recess. Oh. So we just got the fallout there. But I know it's it's a it's a beautiful icon. It was something that I think could possibly be saved, but at that uh, at that point, I think there was no remedy to it. Um, but it's something that I think people identify with in El Paso. Ruben, do you do you remember any of that discussion with uh, Roberto Puga, the uh, bankruptcy trustee? Yes, about uh, about bringing it down. Yeah, you remember the arguments going back and forth? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and people like like Roberto said that you know that people were for it, some people were against it, and and even to this day, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, have negative thoughts about a circle and. You know the, the the claims, of course, that uh, people got sick, and and you know, I mean, I don't I don't doubt their illness, and and uh, you know, if it was from that, but there was a lot of people, even even in our street there on on San Marcos, there was you know a lot of families that worked there, and the, and the men lived to their eighties, you know, and never had any issues, you know. So I don't know if it was something that maybe just affected some people there, or or if it was because it was in a different area. You, know, you didn't hear you didn't hear a lot about you know, the people of La Calavera getting, getting sick or anything because of that. So, you know, when I would talk to, you know, the residents there, I mean, a lot of them, you know, they, they, they praised it, you know, they, they praised it and, and, you know, thanked everybody for the opportunity to work there because like Roberto said that, that, you know, it was a very, very well-paid job uh, for this economy. And, and, you know, people were, were grateful for the, for the, for the work there. Yeah, that also their children were able to go on to some go on to college that they never would have been able to if they'd been in any other menial jobs in El Paso. That's because of the exactly. wonderful money they were making there and just got more ed education, period. Well, somebody said right. that also, Ruben, the possibility was that they, you were so close to the smokestack that the wind, prevailing winds basically blew it over your head. Yeah, and some days yeah. you could have that, exactly. I remember being at UTEP as a student and <clears throat> tasting the sulfur in the back of my mouth. I, I just walking up one of those hills over there. That, anyway, so uh, smelter down and the smelter left its mark. That's for sure. Well, let's take oh, yeah. a let's, yeah. let's let's go back to the big stack there. Uh, we saw the construction of the base, and uh, we have a couple of pictures like number five, big stack, looking straight up. But number six will blow your mind because it, people didn't really realize this until it came down, and maybe they didn't even know it then. Because the ones that that really freaked people out, it was a double stack. There was one inside the other. And we're in this picture here, we're looking up where you see a doorway into the main entrance of the stack. But above it, you see the hole up at the top of the stack. 
And what that was, was that once they, once they could keep the inner stack at a certain temperature, it was an automatic thrust of, of I'm not, I don't know how fast, but w- uh, 30 times straight up, 30 atmospheres straight up, they could, they could shoot that smoke or whatever, whatever the gas was. And it would go straight up at, at a high speed. And that's why it didn't come land on you guys so much. It went way up there, caught the prevailing winds. Uh, the smelter uh, had its own weather station, so they knew when to do it. Mm. And they, they could send that stuff out into Odessa, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Texas, that is. And so it's a matter of understanding how they took advantage, this, 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 uh, as Psycho did, of everything that took advantage of the people, they took advantage of the construction. And to me, it was an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, there's one more uh, picture, number eight, just a couple of guys walking around inside there. We actually got inside the stack before they declared it a hazardous area because at the very early onset of the bankruptcy, you could, uh, we w- were authorized as camera crew to go through there and they didn't pay us. And we got, had to get funded elsewhere or just volunteer. And so th- what happened with all that was we got to go around the inside of the stack and then uh, picture eight is a couple of guys walking around. And that whole thing is, um, a, a strange thing to have done because all of that history, nobody, very, very few people ever got in inside there. Uh, you said you do. You, you, no, I never had that experience. Very few workers got inside there because if you got in there and, and weren't careful, your hard hat would go straight up into the air and out the top of the stack. And because because of the suction, mm-hmm. just just the 30 atmospheres and that 800 and what was it? 25 foot stack, Ruben, 825. Right, 825. That, that is a tall. At one point, it was one of the tallest smokestacks on the planet. And uh, that got surpassed by something in Russia, I believe. Anyway, so that's that's a that's a bizarre piece of the history to, to realize. Um, let's take a look at uh, number seven. As the demolition began, um, we were required more and more to to wear protective gear, and so we didn't go in uh, nasty places anymore. We stayed on the outside and watched. But picture number seven is the uh, the furnace building. That was about a six story, seven story building. The big uh, converter furnaces were in there. They would just pour in all kinds of ore, heat that thing to about 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the, the, each of those, oh, we don't have a picture of the cylinders in there, but those things were about the size of a school bus. And those were huge furnaces going on. And uh, natural gas fired. It was liquid. Uh, liquid oxygen was created on, the, on site, shipped around as liquid, and then shot right into that furnace um, pretty much as a gas. But that whole thing was so dangerous. Hmm. Anything, any spark would go off. You know, uh, the, the two guys that gave us the tour, one, uh, one was an engineer there and one was a, uh, uh, a furnace operator. And they both pulled up their legs and said, hey, oh, I want to I see your scar. Oh, you got scars too. So, I mean, that stuff just went on and on and on. All right, we need to take a break here and come back in a minute. Roberto Salas in the studio, Ruben Escondon on the phone, and Melissa sitting here raring to go in the second hour with some of the older history that uh, that we have we have found uh take a break here come back in just a moment monterey asset management is proud to sponsor the el paso history show if you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market maybe you should invest in real estate monterey asset manages apartments in el paso and helps investors buy hold and sell property see the new website m1ep.com m numeral one ep.com To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation of investing in real estate, call Certified Property Manager Ray Baca, 915-592-4549, 592-4549. Struggling with CPAP? Now there's Inspire, the only FDA-approved obstructive sleep apnea treatment that works inside the body to treat the root cause of sleep apnea with just the click of a button. No mask, no hose, just sleep. Visit InspireSleep.com to learn more. What's all the buzz about nasal irrigation and navage, navage, navage? And should I try it? Here's the science. Airborne germs invade through your nose. It's the body's air filter for trapping allergens and viruses. When your nose gets clogged, it's less effective and germs multiply. Eventually, your immune system can get overwhelmed and you get sick. Nasal irrigation is an effective, all-natural way to clean your nose. It's not a drug. It's more like plumbing. Saline goes in one nostril, around the back of the nose, and out the other nostril, flushing out mucus and germs. I'm Martin Hoke, and I invented Navage to make cleaning your nose easy. 
It's the world's only nose cleaner with powered suction. Navaj pulls out the bad stuff so you can breathe better, sleep deeper, snore less, and feel healthier. At Walgreens, CDS, Rite Aid, Target, Bed Bath, and Walmart, or go to navaj.com for a free gift with purchase. Over 2 million sold. Navaj, N-A-V-A-G-E. Clean nose, healthy life. Want to make a difference? Join KBR, a government contractor hiring hundreds of positions on military bases around the country to aid Afghan guests. Positions include food services, logistics, laborers, and many more. We offer great benefits, such as a $2,000 completion bonus, health care, meal allowance, and travel perks. COVID vaccination is required. At KBR, do work that matters. Apply today at oaw.kbr.com. That's oaw.kbr.com. Sometimes it feels like your business is going 100 miles an hour, barely keeping up. Dell Technologies Advisors have the Windows PCs and tech you need to help you get past whatever's in front of you. Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. A start to a simpler experience with Windows 11 Pro. Because you never hear this. Hey, hon, I'm late. Chris, I am so pleased you missed the beginning of our meeting. Thanks for making me wait, Dad. I talk to a lot of strangers. Check on your commute. Stay informed. Traffic and weather all day. Or you might never hear the end of it. Well, you were late to our anniversary dinner that one time. Yes, how could I forget? El Paso's News Radio, 690 KTSM. El Paso's News Radio, 690 KTSM. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. And by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. Here again, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Pohl. We remind you about all kinds of interesting things going on. Here's another one. Rick Kern's music podcast is called Talk and Rock Radio. And we got him coming up in a couple of weeks. And he's going to bring a, an interesting guest, a musical guest in a, oh, cool. from, from El Paso. So, all right, what do you got? All righty, let's go. Well, we need to go get out and shop at Christmas time. We've got all these things coming up. MissionDelray.com is your place to go. or you And you'll visit their new 12,000 square foot showroom, which is really impressive. We went there a couple of weeks ago on Lee Trevino. And they're going to open Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5. Shop Mexican Talavera, Native American artifacts, and thousands of Southwest items and decor. All right, where were we when we last left, left off this parade of history going by? <laughs> where were we? What were we doing here? Um, the old church, we did that. The old pictures of Smelter Town. Uh, I guess, Ruben, do you have any more thoughts? We've got a couple of minutes left in this hour on, on the experience of living a part of the community. You said there was a rivalry between Calavetta and the other parts of Smelter Town. Well, there was, just with us kids, you know, growing up there and, and – uh... Like it was, it was, you know, the, the, we, we played it out with sports. I think that was the big thing, you know, that, that we would go and, and challenge these guys to football games and baseball games, you know, and, and, uh, and it would be, a, a you know, people would get together in the street to watch us play. You know, I, I had an advantage, you know, I had a German shepherd growing up ah. <laughs> and, uh, and this dog wouldn't let anybody get near me. As soon as somebody would come up to, to either, you know, we wouldn't play tackle, but we'd play touch. And as soon as somebody would come up, he'd start growling and take off at him. So nobody <laughs> wanted to touch me out. You know, so. so you <laughs> won the game, huh? Advantage. You, you, always, you always won the game. Yep, yep, we did. <laughs> cool. Uh, the whole thing about the, the, the Smelter Town experience, the one reason I wanted to visit that with you guys uh, because both of you had, had seen so much of it. You, uh, Roberto's told us a whole bunch of stories he heard at the dinner table. And, and the whole idea of what was going on there was very unusual and very unknown because what went on inside of, of Asarco was not talked about. And the, the priest there, Father Costa, would not really want to, the people to be part of El Paso. He kept them Mexican, and he kept them in that location, basically. And that's how a lot right. of that went. So what do we got here, Andrew? Uh, oh, hey, David, 
Uh, I'll tell you what, David, uh, let's put you on for a second here. Go ahead, David Itzel. Go ahead. What, what, uh, Jackson, we hey, got, David. we got about two minutes here. What do you have in the way of information on the sale? Because you, you're the agent, but you got to be very careful what you say, I guess. Right. Well, we've been marketing the property again uh, after uh, we uh, uh, sort of repositioned ourselves uh, post UTEP uh, transaction. And um, it, we have some good prospects. And I can't say much more, but it looks like we have some real opportunity to redevelop that site. Uh, city of El Paso seems to be willing to cooperate, and that'll be helpful on the entitlement side. And uh, the people we're talking to seem to have the money to and the resources to um, invest in the property. That'd be great. Now you have signs up in various locations. Are, are pieces for sale, or how do you how do you want to address that? <laughs> we we did get the trust to agree to a parcel pricing uh, schedule, but the the intent of the trust was all always to sunset it when it was over and, and to liquidate all the assets. Okay. So we really, we don't want to be stuck with any, any particular parcel. So we're trying to sell it all in one, in one package. Well, fair enough. Thank you for calling in and letting us know all that. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Uh, you take You're a read. Bye-bye. Thanks bye a lot. Bye-bye, David. Well, it's an interesting piece of property. And if you had big dreams and big money, talk to David. Absolutely. He, yeah, he, he, he's a, big money. I certainly would like to suggest that a monument to the people from Smelter Town, the workers, to... would be a nice a uh, museum. Well, a museum. museum. Of, absolutely. Yeah. Something that would bring in uh, people from out of town. we got to take a break here, come back after the news, and we'll talk further about the, the whole inside job of looking at the Smelter Crystal Ray, which we haven't done, and a Sarko. Back, at, back after the news. Thank you for listening to the El Paso History Show. There's another hour to go, so please stay tuned. This hour is brought to you by Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the one and only Margarita, and by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. And by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. We'll be right back after the news, right here on News Radio 690, KTSM, El Paso. Is that a faucet running? That's not a faucet. That's a river rushing through the forest. Forest rivers provide over 100 million people with clean water to drink. What? I can't hear you because of the vacuum. That's not a vacuum. That's the trees in the forest cleaning up the air we breathe. I didn't know the trees were so amazing. Yep. And the forest gives us shade, trees to climb. That's awesome. Let's go explore some more. Visit the forest today and enjoy all it does just for you. To learn more about the forest and find one near you, go to discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Hey, El Paso and surrounding areas. Are you ready for some savings? Ivan Ochoa, general manager from Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Fiat. Right now, we are paying top dollar for all trades. Plus, 0% financing for 72 months on several models. There's never been a better time to trade or upgrade for less. During Jeep Adventure Days, Sunland Park Chrysler, Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat will take any trade in any condition, regardless of make or model, car, truck, or SUV. We want it, even if you owe up to $10,000 more than your old car's worth, so you can drive home a new or certified pre-owned vehicle for less. Save thousands in interest with zero APR for 72 months. Plus, save thousands at the all-new Sunland Park Dodge Certified Pre-Owned Super Center. Our inventory of cars, trucks, and SUVs has never been better. All military personnel and all first responders receive an additional discount. Thank you for your service. Sunland Park Chrysler. Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat. We're buying a car. It's fun. And I can at Sunland Park Drive or online at SunlandParkDodge.com. Estamos en tu esquina, El Paso. El Paso Strong. Includes factory rebate and dealer discount plus TTNL. Zero APR is thirteen seventy two per thousand finance. On select vehicles with approved credit. Offers not combined. The October Muster Used Car Sales Event is on. Right now, it costs a Buick GMC. Yeah. It's going on right now. A sale so scary good that you'll scream. <laughs> One owner trades, lease returns, and we've dug up some unique specimens just for you. Like this 2015 Mustang 24877 or this 2019 Toyota Tundra 58777 or wow, this 2020 Yukon Denali 461877. Financing through more than 20 banks and credit unions. Buy here, pay here financing by La Casita. The October Used Car Monster Sales Event is on right now at Casa Buick GMC. Montana Airway by the airport. 
NBC News Radio. I'm Scott Carr. Two major retail chains are now offering COVID booster shots from Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. Walmart and Walgreens Pharmacy started giving out the shots yesterday, as well as the Pfizer vaccine booster. CVS is offering Moderna boosters, but not Johnson & Johnson. This week, the CDC recommended the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson boosters. A senior al-Qaeda leader has been killed in a U.S. drone strike. U.S. Central Command says Abdul Hamid al Matar was killed in Syria by a military drone. Supply chain issues are leading to a nationwide drug shortage. The American Medical Association calls it an urgent public health crisis. The FDA is listing 115 drugs in short supply nationally. Actor Alec Baldwin says there are no words to convey his shock and sadness regarding the fatal shooting of a cinematographer on his movie set in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The director of photography killed this week being remembered as a promising cinematographer. Helena Hutchins was fatally shot with a prop gun by Baldwin on the set of a Western titled Rust. Head of the American Society of Cinematographers, Stephen Lighthill, says that a mother and a wife could be killed on a set is devastating. Everyone is heartbroken and shocked that this took place. Helena just brought to it the ability to, to take something ordinary and make it extraordinary. In baseball, the Houston Astros advancing to the World Series. Joel Stern has details. The Astros' 5 nothing win over the Red Sox in Game 6 of the ALCS gives Houston its third American League title in the past five seasons. Luis Garcia, who lasted just one inning in Game 2, gives up one hit through five and two-thirds. And a California coroner's office is confirming actress and model Tawny Katane died of heart disease. She appeared in several 80s movies, including Bachelor Party, starring Tom Hanks. Scott Carr, NBC News Radio. From the KFOX 14 Severe Weather Center, this is Chief Meteorologist Sandra Diaz. So it looks like we're in for another weather pattern change as we get into the weekend as more of a west wind drives in. That's going to warm us up but keep us a bit on the breezy side this weekend, but we still remain dry. It's really not until Tuesday that we will see our next significant system moving in, drags in a cold front, and increases our winds. What's all the buzz about nasal irrigation and navage, navage, navage? And should I try it? Here's the science. Airborne germs invade through your nose. It's the body's air filter for trapping allergens and viruses. When your nose gets clogged, it's less effective and germs multiply. Eventually, your immune system can get overwhelmed and you get sick. Nasal irrigation is an effective, all-natural way to clean your nose. It's not a drug. It's more like plumbing. Saline goes in one nostril, around the back of the nose, and out the other nostril, flushing out mucus and germs. I'm Martin Hoke, and I invented Navage to make cleaning your nose easy. It's the world's only nose cleaner with powered suction. Navage pulls out the bad stuff so you can breathe better, sleep deeper, snore less, and feel healthier. At Walgreens, CDS, Rite Aid, Target, Bed Bath, and Walmart. Or go to Navage.com for a free gift with purchase. Over 2 million sold. Navage, N-A-V-A-G-E. Clean nose, healthy life. Radio advertising can connect your business with holiday shoppers wherever they go. Use iHeart Ad Builder to create an affordable custom radio ad right on your phone. Just click, listen, approve, then hear it on the radio. Create your customized ad today at iHeartAdBuilder.com. Listen to Kelvin. What he's about to say could change your life. I'm 6'2", and I was about 290. I lost weight fast. I trimmed down. Now I'm about 235. I'm probably at about, oh, 9, maybe 10% body fat. That's great. I lost probably at least 60 pounds in probably three and a half, four months. Color of my hair is coming back. Skin looks better. Um, obviously gaining muscle. My muscle mass is coming back. Thank you for providing an awesome product. Somebody who actually has and does what they say they will. That's awesome. That's great, Kelvin. Losing that belly fat in less than four months is outstanding. Since 2004, Andro 400 has been changing men's lives, like Kelvin, and can help you lose belly fat, gain energy, and improve your lifestyle. We guarantee it. Go to andro400.com for more true testimonials, before and after photos, and special discounts. Only available on andro400.com andro400.com news radio 690 ktsm news radio 690 ktsm presents the second hour of the el paso history show with documentary filmmaker jackson polk and historian melissa Sargent. streaming live at ktsmradio.com Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. 
by Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the one and only Margarita. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. And by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. And now, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. And we start Hour 2 of the El Paso History Show. Uh, as we always do, El Paso History Moment, produced and uh, written by Melissa Sargent for the El Paso History Alliance page on Facebook. Her story today is about a Sarco and Calavada Canyon. From squatter to property owner, a small canyon named La Calavera, or Skull Canyon, located on a Sarco smelter property, was becoming home to smelter workers who were considered squatters on the land and were building their homes illegally on the property. Asarco was very concerned with the rapid growth of squatters in the canyon, but at the same time did not want to evict the people either. So, in an attempt to stop the growth of more squatters, Asarco charged them $2 a year in rent. But this still did not stop new squatters from settling in. By 1950, Asarco finally decided to survey the land and deed it to the squatters and their heirs. More history next week on El Paso History Moments. I'm Melissa Sargent for the El Paso History Alliance. You do this all the time. Yeah. Now, oh, I really want to point out real quick, the gentleman that, uh, there was a gentleman that said he couldn't get on to uh, the show on, via YouTube. You need to go to YouTube.com and then go to El Paso History TV. You can do a search on it and it'll take you right there and you can click on the top link and you'll be into the live show. I apparently have a bunch of people watching it right now. So uh, to, the th- to the thing about your history moment, uh, you do this for the History Alliance? El Paso History Alliance, and it's a great it's a great Facebook page where you can learn a lot of history uh, and, and articles on architectural history, oh, just general history, and it's managed by uh, Max Max Grossman and Mark Stone. And then you have Barbara Given Bainey's page, which is Remember in El Paso When, which is a great site also and probably one of the premier in the sense of history and has been around forever and ever has tons of stories. You need to go there and visit with them. She's one of those major volunteers, the keepers of the El Paso history. And she's the chief administrator. Margaret Smith is on there. Rick Duncan, Ken Weiss, Craig Hayes, Nick, Rick Nahara, and Isaac Williams. Great place to go there. Okay. A lot of history to talk about in El Paso. Uh, we, Ruben, we still got you somewhere, don't we? Yes, sir. Well, right bl- you bless you for being there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the old original history. Um, if you can uh, chime in. And Roberto Salas sitting here in the studio with us. But Melissa has taken a look at some of the old stuff, um, including the number 10A. There's a plaque there that uh, is up on the, still up at the moment on the original administration building. And that plaque uh, designates it as an I think that says 1887 on it. Uh, well, there's no, I, I'm not sure it's on administration. I know there's one that's right on the, the dirt road by the river, by the bridge. There's a oh, this, this, there. this one's still on the building. It's still in the building. Okay, yeah. but there's another one. It's both in Spanish and in English. Well, it was in, in Spanish. It fell down. Somebody knocked it over. But yeah, it's it explains it very very thoroughly about the history of the area. So talk talk about that original history what you can. Well, I think what the the interesting thing about it is you had these people that were coming north and they were actually Mexican employees in the sense that they were living in Mexico and working at the smelter plant. And like, like I said earlier, they came from uh, San, Santa Rosalia in Chihuahua, was the majority of them. And so they just started to kind of stay on this side of the river because it was easier for them to go to work each day. So you had these people building these you know, like little shacks. I mean, literally just wood and, and whatever they could find to put their houses together. And that was the beginning of Smelter Town, basically. They had streets laid out and named. Init- not initially. I mean, it was just kind of, uh, helter skelter in its look but it was basically built in a riverbed yeah i mean it was and it, they got flooded out every time there was a major storm because the, the river so shallow in that area and then they did they started to build it as they became more established uh they became citizens uh more people were coming in from out of the on the other parts of el paso to work there but they were mostly hispanic working there and the jo- the jobs well, like i said some of the best paid and continuous working for those people at that time episd put a school in there yeah yeah, EPI is but it was the uh, EB Jones yeah, School, EB Jones. and, and, and that who, was put in the late 1800s. Who was EB Jones? EB Jones was the, uh, I guess, the financial person for Asarco. He was the one that handled the money 
for the whole company. So I, the school was named after him because I had looked into it. I said, who was E.B. Jones? Yeah, why would we have that name here? Yeah. Well, and, and it was built up a little bit. I actually went there one time uh, when it was an active school, and it was built up a little bit. So I guess they were thinking, well, if it floods here, let's get up a little bit. Absolutely. And it, it had to go when the uh, the whole uh, uh, Sarko basically went to bankruptcy and then it closed down, I guess, way before that in the 70s. Ruben, what do you remember about it? You got more history there? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ruben, what do you remember, yeah. know about all 70, that? 74, I think, was when they when they condemned that whole area and then started knocking everything down. And that was, you know, and, and I think, you know, we had talked about this, Jackson. We had said, you know, about the lead contamination, but also that there was contamination from the underground leaking tanks that, that, yes. uh, that people didn't know about. That's what, know, That's what really turned it off. Yeah, and that's what really made the difference that you know that the that the diesel or whatever fuel or whatever it was that was in the ground made it made it uh, you know that that pushed them over the edge to completely shut it down. Well, that that was that people thought it was the lead coming out of the stack, but it was the leaking kerosene tank for years and decades that basically took right. out took out that area. And uh, I don't know who paid for those people to move. Do you guys know? I don't think there was any payment, were there? Was it? I think it was just say go. <laughs> You're gone. Yeah. You're gone. Yeah, because they could build, but they couldn't own the lands since it was a company yeah, I don't, town. I was. I think there was a settlement later, though. I think some people did sue. Do you remember that, Ruben? I don't remember if they got paid or not. You know, I I, I don't remember if there was any kind of uh, any kind of assistance. You know, to to move and and stuff like that. You know. Well, because and, they didn't own the property, yeah. they didn't own the property. They owned the, the the building itself, but you know, there was they couldn't take that with them. Exactly. I guess maybe that might have, might have been the issue behind that. Right. And a lot of people ended up moving to Anapara, what is now Middle Vista and Sunland Park. Those there was yeah. areas available up there. Buena Vista as well it was a suburb. You know, that got suburb. bigger all of a sudden. It got bigger, yeah, because it was a big community until the freeways came in and just yeah you know, took some took took took. took. It took some of your family's property. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, yeah. then you had Calavera County. Uh, I mean, Canyon, Calavera. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> county. I know. Now, I can't, now, no, it's not in the county. <laughs> That's what we need to talk about. Cal, uh, Calavera uh, Canyon or Skull Canyon, mm -hmm. where people moved in and settled, too. Like, exactly. So they, like they did in the history Even more. And one of the things I want to clarify is that the Calavera, which is skull, is because of the cemetery that's right mm -hmm. up on yeah. top. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I was up there. I never knew where my grandfather was at. And uh, I just kind of went one day and just kind of felt around. I figured, where are you? Where are you? 13, and Andrew. Lo and behold, I found him and found some other Honestly, relatives, which was wow. really nice to just. Uh, that's really cool. To to book. Yeah. Like find said, him. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've got a lift. There's a listing, I think, of the graves too, isn't there? Somebody has. A, I believe a so, because there were people. It looks much better now than it did in yeah. the old days, but it's been cleaned up and it's been uh, um, kind of spruced up a little bit. It's been fenced in, which is one of the things the important Blessing, things because yeah. there was a lot of vandalism going on at one time. Oh, terrible! And you have to get a key to get in there now, or contact the person with a key. You know. Yeah, and I believe the diocese actually owns it. Oh, is that right? The Catholic no. Diocese owns the property. Probably so. I so, imagine. yeah. And uh, it's being. Yeah, they do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, just confirmed. It's yeah. being cataloged. Uh, I think uh, Mark Syok knows how to do that. Yeah, he probably. Yeah, he, 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 was, he was running all about that. Well, yeah. let's move on to uh, the preparation for demolition, 12A. And it um, that picture shows the whole site pretty much cleared off, off of everything in metal that could have been sold except the powerhouse. Roberto Puga thought somehow somebody was going to come along and buy the powerhouse and make it into a museum. And, uh, well, no, that didn't quite happen. Uh, that, that place was a toxic mess all by itself. So I don't think that would have ever stood the test of time. But as you see in the, in the shot there, there are landing pads laid out for each of those uh, towers to come down. And the day of the event... Um, April 13th, 2013, I believe it was, it was a, uh, Saturday. The, uh, they, they, they blew off the, uh, uh, you can see on 12 B they're, they're loading. Look at 12 B here. Yeah, that's a quite a photograph where he's packing in. What is it? Dynamite? Oh yeah. Thing? Caps. Yeah. Oh, those are two foot thick walls oh. and they filled them up with dynamite. They cut as big a hole as they could to leave the building standing. And on the opposite side, that morning, they went and cut all the rebar 
that was holding the backside up. So, I mean, uh, a, a good wind later in the day would have taken the thing down. They had to take it down because they cut the rebar. And so they went about, they had to take a break because the police were ro roaming through the cemetery on, on scooters or something. And they found people hiding in there, taking pictures. You look like you knew some of them. Uh, yes, one of my nephews from California, he drove down to take some uh, photographs. And I think they delayed it because they finally kicked him out of there. <laughs> well, do you know what really happened? They found a guy standing there with a hard hat and a safety vest. So the police turned him over to him. Who was that guy, Ruben? My dad. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the most bizarre thing. He said, I'll take care of him. And so the cops <laughs> drove off and they just peeked over the hill and watched. I mean, they could have been hurt, I guess, uh, getting stuff flown up. But when the things hit the ground, uh, I was over there in the media area. Andrew was with me. And uh, where were you? We I was filming from Buena Vista. We okay. had several cameras uh, throughout. I was one in Crystal Ray. And this is this is my nephew who was connecting all those together. He's a filmmaker in Los Angeles. Oh, cool. And so we had one, I guess, where the media was. I was shooting from Buena Vista and. I think Ruben could have been up on top of Crystal Ray. Where were you? Crystal Ray, I was at the top. I had, I had, I think, Channel 7, Channel 9 up there. With oh, yeah, I, I had yeah. a camera up there. Fernie was oh, up there. A, yeah, that's right. Fernie was up there with us. And so it was a media event un, oh, yeah. unprecedented in El Paso. There, I, I turned around from the media area, I looked around. The hillsides were full of people. Yes. Oh, Every, yeah, they were all back over by the hotel over in that area where oh, they weren't supposed to be. Over by Channel 7 up yeah. in there. I mean, it was incredible. And when the cloud hit and, and sprung up, it went through downtown El Paso, sort of. Otherwise, everybody else was going to get really wiped out with whatever that stuff was. And I'm not sure anybody really knows what that stuff was. But whatever, the, when the stacks came down, take a look at 12C. When the stacks finally came down, it was an incredible event. And did, did, could you feel the ground shake where you oh, were? Oh, yes. Yes, I could. I, I don't know yeah. what it registered at UTEP. It and was some, sound. some sort of earthquake and an incredible whoomp. And up at the Channel 7 studios, uh, they had me in and out on live shots with them that morning. Um, it shook the uh, light grid above the <laughs> above the anchor people. Like, okay, this is a big deal here. And once it was over, it was like, oh, my goodness. And frankly, right after that, for the, you know, they had one news conference right after that. After that, nobody cared what happened to Osarco. It, the, the interest was over. The uh, publicity was over. And then it was a matter of David Etzel trying to come along with Puga and figure out what to do with it. So I, I don't know exactly what you think of that whole event. No one was willing to take the liability of the stacks. City Hall had a shot at it. But, and, and, and what, what the trustee said, if, if you leave that up there, you cannot ever have anything built underneath it just because it may someday come down. Hmm. So that would diminish the value of the property. And everybody's, oh, we could put a restaurant up there. You could have done a lot of stuff, I suppose, temporarily. All that stuff, whatever it was up there, was going to come down. So they took it down. Um, they missed their landing spot by maybe, I don't know, 200 feet. And the landing spot, uh, it took out some of their water cannons. They had water cannons going, thinking that that would basically uh, alleviate the, the smoke and whatever. It turned out to be not true. That stuff just took up and... and it, I was on the I was on the upwind side, so I didn't get it. But people on the downwind, I, I'm sure they got it. And it made all the newspapers. It made national. It was an amazing event there. So anyway, that was the taking down of the two big stacks. The first one went, and we were allowed to put cameras over there, but we couldn't be there. I made a deal with Ch uh, Channel Seven. We had four uh, small cameras over there. I told them the sequence to switch. And if you ever saw the video, that video is online for oh, free. Is that really? I never saw the actual footage of the, of the, those cameras that were close by. Take a that look. must have been something. Well, I take a look see. at it. We yeah. had four of them. So I told the guy, focus on uh, the small stack first. And as soon as it went off, you know, then we took to the second, uh, 30 seconds later, the big stack uh, took it. Uh, all that dynamite went off. And then we switched back to another camera. And then you could see basically the... Uh, the small stack coming down and hitting. And then all of a sudden, all the debris going past the camera obliterated the view. And then we went back to another shot and, and the mess was a wide shot and it go take a look at that's free. Oh, yeah, and, and, and what's, how do you get there again, Melissa on the YouTube channel? 
Oh, you go to uh, YouTube.com and then you can either do a search for El Paso History TV or just type that in and it'll take you right to the site and you can get live on there. And there's not only the live shot we're doing today, but you can also get the three streaming uh, shots, the, th the three playlists, as we call them. I just now posted a uh, Texas Historical Commission. It was a uh, it was a cultural resources program that they did through the International Boundary of Water Commission and the Texas Historical Commission. Mark Howe did this video. It's about 50 minutes long, and it talks about uh, the name Smeltertown, a community lost to time along the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's a very nice little detailed video. So I'm going to post that up for people if they want to learn more on the Facebook page, because there's so much history that goes back with that town. I mean, at what, 1937, I think there were 2,500 people that lived in Smeltertown and all around the area around that. So that's a lot of people for that time period. Well, they had, at one point, they had three shifts a day, um, I believe 1,200 people each shift, 24-7. Uh, An amazing place. All right, taking a break here on the El Paso History Radio Show. We'll see you in a minute. El Paso History TV is now available for free on YouTube.com. Take a look at recent ABC7 News reports by Bernie Sargent on El Paso History TV about Waco Tanks, the Franklin Mountains, Concordia Cemetery, and more. The YouTube channel also has more than 100 videos about El Paso history with lectures, documentaries, and various history clips. Go to YouTube.com slash El Paso History TV and find out how Texas history begins in El Paso. Here's the deal. When you combine State Farm Home and Auto Insurance, you save an average of $889. State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson is ready to help you combine home and auto and save here in El Paso. Call 915-581-0000 today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Average annual per household savings based on a 2019 national survey by State Farm of new policyholders who reported savings by switching to State Farm. Hey, El Paso and surrounding areas, are you ready for some savings? Ivan Ochoa, General Manager from Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Fiat. Right now, we are paying top dollar for all trades, plus 0% financing for 72 months on several models. There's never been a better time to trade or upgrade for less. During Jeep Adventure Days, Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat will take any trade in any condition, regardless of make or model, car, truck, or SUV. We want it, even if you owe up to $10,000 more than your old car is worth, so you can drive home a new or certified pre-owned vehicle for less. Save thousands in interest with zero APR for 72 months. Plus, save thousands at the all-new Sun Park Dodge Certified Pre-Owned Super Center. Our inventory of cars, trucks, and SUVs has never been better. All military personnel and all first responders receive an additional discount. Thank you for your service. Sun Park Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, Ram, Fiat. We're buying a car. It's fun. At I-10 at Sun Park Drive or online at SunlandParkDodge.com. Estamos en tu esquina, El Paso. El Paso Strong. Includes factory rebate and dealer discount plus TTNL. Zero APR is thirteen seventy two per thousand finance. On select vehicles with approved credit. Offers not combined. Last Halloween. A new podcast scared us all to the bone. Now, 13 Days of Halloween is back. Starting October 19th, you'll hear one story each night, ending on Halloween. And beware, this show is produced in cutting-edge 3D audio for a truly immersive, terrifying tale. Nothing comes out of these waters once it's gone. From iHeartRadio 3D Audio and Blumhouse Television, listen to 13 Days of Halloween on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know the arrow in Amazon's logo represents A to Z? Maybe the My Computer Career logo should represent unemployed to employed. Ryan was out of work when he started classes in March. In September, he started his IT career working for... Amazon, making more money than he ever thought possible. Here's a prime opportunity. Go to mycomputercareer.edu and take the free career evaluation today. You could start your new life as an IT pro in as little as four months. It's not rocket science. It's mycomputercareer.edu. Here's a fact. COVID hospitalizations of young people have tripled since the start of summer. Also a fact. Vaccines are highly effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths, even from the Delta variant. If you've got questions about COVID vaccines, talk to a doctor, because our kids are irreplaceable. We can do this. Find vaccines near you at vaccines.gov. Paid for by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. News Radio 690 KTSM El Paso. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Show. 
Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. Caravan, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. All right. On October 30th next week, we will explain the event known as Dia de los Muertos or Day of the Dead with Concordia Cemetery Association members. And they will also explain that event at Concordia Cemetery. And then we have on November the 6th, El Paso Symphony Orchestra Executive Director Ruth Ellen Jacobson. She's our guest to explain the symphony's history, which is long and unusual all by itself. And uh, it used to be on KTSM radio way back in the day. November 13th, this is where you will hear the world-class artist, recording artist, Terry Manning. He and uh, Rick Kern from Talk and Rock Radio are going to come on and talk about the career of Terry. He may even bring a guitar, I'm not sure. But we're going to find out how El Paso has a world-class recording artist living right here in El Paso. And November the 20th, David Varela, concierge, concierge at the El Paso Del Norte Hotel, and historian Bernie Sargent, they're going to take us on a uh, d detailed tour of the new hotel from an insider perspective because the concierge dude, he knows stuff that not even Bernie knows. So how about that? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's really exciting news to hear that the, an El Paso church has received a $250,000 grant. And that church is Sa El Paso's Sacred Heart. And it's a preservation grant that they're receiving from the National Fund of Sacred Places, which is a partner of the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation, and they're going to be giving a two hundred fifty thousand dollars grant. Now that means they also have to match that money too, part of it. Oh, so, yeah. So it's it's and that's what many grants know that. are now. There's very few. They're just here's a check. You know, you have to work at you know getting matching money. So hopefully people will donate to that. But it's a big honor <clears throat> for El Paso for the church. Oh, that's Sacred fabulous. Heart. All right, we got about uh, three or four minutes here in this in this segment, uh, Ruben. And if you don't mind, let's now look and and Roberto Salas in the studio. Let's now take a look at what it is to mix the whole history of Mount Cristo Rey in with Smelter Town and Asarco, and how did all that work? And and Ruben, you're on the committee to restore the uh, the monument. It's, what is it, what's the actual name of the committee? It is the Mount Cristo Rey Restoration Committee. And what do you guys do? Well. Year round, we maintain the monument itself, the uh, the trails. The uh, areas uh, leading up to the parking lots, and uh, pretty much do the preservation. And 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 right now, it's more of a we're in a repair mode because of all the rains. You know, the trail was was washed out pretty bad, so we had um, you know oh, we yeah. had to go up there and take loads of screening and and fill dirt to to you know secure those those areas that are they were pretty much unpassable at one time. You know, now they've been working on it a little bit more. Well, Ruben, I, so, I, I, I remember the 06 flood. And basically, what you got—you guys had a donation of a Bobcat tractor, and, and it's a good thing because that screening and all that stuff that washes down has more miles on it as it goes down the mountain, goes back up the mountain, comes down the mountain. And was there ever talk about an asphalt uh, track? There's been there's been talk in the past, but you know, that there's really been no one to uh, give us a, a, a decent proposal as far as how they would do it. You know, the water gets under that asphalt up there, and unless, I mean, there's really no way to seal it. You know, we looked at uh, a composite material that, that this guy wanted to go spray up there along the trail, um, you know, but it never, never progressed, you know, other than his presentation, that was it. You know, so, I mean, there's there's always been talk of people that have ideas, and I get the calls, you know, all the time about, you know, this guy wants to light the monument, this guy wants to pave the areas, and you know, but the, the, the whole thing was that, that uh, you know, Monsignor Costa's vision uh, and Urbisi Soler, you know, they, they wanted it natural, uh, you know, the trails and everything. The only thing that, that is different from the original, um, the original vision that they had was at the top, uh, Urbisi Soler wanted a, a marble um, area, I guess you could say, where the altar is, that he wanted all that done in marble. Uh, as a as a monument to the shrine itself, you know, and and it never got done. I mean, they ran out of money, and and they never, you know, they never got that done. So 
over the years it's been it's been it's actually sad that you know we can't do much with it you know it's always just a maintenance kind of deal that we have to go up there and and uh, and and maintain it you know that's all we have to do there's no improvements really that can be made um i had the the, the corps of uh, engineers go out there uh, because we were looking at at how to divert the runoffs and and stuff like that and they you know again they they came out and tickled and took a look but we never got anything done you know that was it well also the picture that we just had up there um number 14 that was a picture of the ridge and Urbisi Solaire used to always climb straight up the side of that ridge to, to go work right. on to go work on the monument. The thing was though, the Padre uh, Costa, he wanted it more like Scenic Drive. And that there was a conflict. Yeah. So Solaire was down in Austin picking out the the limestone and beginning to carve it uh, down in Austin. And while he was gone, the uh, the Padre went and had a road dynamited up there. And that, right. that became a major conflict and I'm glad they resolved it. Cause that could have been, they just left a mess. Roberto, your yeah, thoughts. He was, I think he, he threatened to quit the project when, when he found out that they had done that, yeah. cause that wasn't the vision that he had. He wanted it to sit up on top with, you know, just the axes of people climbing up. But I mean, you know, I'm glad they did the road. It, it would have been, it would have been hard for anybody to really enjoy it. Your thoughts. Oh, I think it was a good idea to actually make that road. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for people to go up there. You wouldn't have a pilgrimage. And normally, your pilgrimage is the last Sunday in October, which is why I thought this would be appropriate to, to have you guys on. But that got canceled, as you mentioned earlier in the show. And uh, that's too bad because, well, I mean, look at all the problems it would have had, though. So it is what it is in the COVID era. So. All right, we're going right. to come back in a minute. Take, you got a, a thought or two? Well, I wanted to add to the, the we were talking about Smelter Town Cemetery, and we're trying to find a list. Ruben, do you know if there's an available list of the people that are buried in the cemetery up there? You know, I have not been able to find one. I've gone to the diocese. I've gone to the archives, and and there's really no, no records. The books that were uh, initially at the church down on the bottom that, that had the records of who was buried up yeah. there, uh, disappeared, you know, when they knocked down the church and everything, uh, somebody grabbed the books and, and, uh, you know, they disappeared. So, you know, we, we don't know where they, where they went. So there's really no, no record that I know of. I did find on uh, find a grave, go to Smelter Town Cemetery and they have and, some people buried there. All right. We need to take right. a break here, taking the break here That's and come right. back in a minute. And let's start, start to focus a little more on Crystal Ray and how that was integral into the whole Asarco smelter town adventure because i mean it's, it's part of everybody's history that was over there all right come back in just a moment if you're a local business owner you know how important it is to be here for your customers state farm agent ralph dickerson runs a small business in el paso too and ralph dickerson's here to help you protect your small business give him a call 915-581-0000 or come by his office located at 497 north wrestler suite a right at the corner of wrestler and orizaba Stop in today. Call 581-0000 for State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. The October Muster Used Car Sales Event is on. Right now, it costs a Buick GMC. Yeah, it's going on right now. A sale so scary good that you'll scream. One owner trades, lease returns, and we've dug up some unique specimens just for you. Like this 2015 Mustang, 24,877. Or this 2019 Toyota Tundra, 58,777. Or wow, this 2020 Yukon Denali, 461,877. Financing through more than 20 banks and credit unions. Buy here, pay here, financing by La Casita. The October Used Car Monster Sales Event is on right now at Casa Buick GMC. And at Airway by the airport. This holiday season, don't buy the can, buy the box to help support those in need in our community. In this most wonderful and generous time of year, instead of donating canned goods, give directly to our local El Pasoans Fighting Hunger Food Bank or $1 can mean seven meals to help end hunger for our neighbors. Do the most good by donating directly for less than $14 can buy the box to feed a local child for a whole month or increase your donation to cover them for the entire year. Visit El Paso and Fighting Hunger.org today to support your community by the box. 
What's all the buzz about nasal irrigation and navage, navage, navage? And should I try it? Here's the science. Airborne germs invade through your nose. It's the body's air filter for trapping allergens and viruses. When your nose gets clogged, it's less effective and germs multiply. Eventually, your immune system can get overwhelmed and you get sick. Nasal irrigation is an effective, all-natural way to clean your nose. It's not a drug. It's more like plumbing. Saline goes in one nostril, around the back of the nose, and out the other nostril, flushing out mucus and germs. I'm Martin Hoke, and I invented Navage to make cleaning your nose easy. It's the world's only nose cleaner with powered suction. Navage pulls out the bad stuff so you can breathe better, sleep deeper, snore less, and feel healthier. At Walgreens, CDS, Rite Aid, Target, Bed Bath, and Walmart. Or go to Navage.com for a free gift with purchase. Over 2 million sold. Navage, N-A-V-A-G-E. Clean nose, healthy life. Prescription products require an online consultation. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Think you might have ED? Not sure? Well, we'd like to let you in on a little secret. ED is common. About 40% of men experience ED by age 40. But the solution is simple. Find it at 4 I didn't have to talk to a doctor in person. There was no copay. And the medication was shipped right to my door in discreet packaging. Hims took care of it. Fast and easy. Now our love life is better than ever. Get access to doctors online who can prescribe you FDA-approved ED medication if appropriate. The same active ingredient as name brands, but 90% cheaper. Skip the waiting rooms and pharmacy lines. Get a free medical consultation and rise to the occasion or your money back. Go to 4 slash joy to get your first visit free. No copay required. The only way to get this special offer is to go to 4 slash joy. F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash J-O-Y. El Paso's News Radio, 690 KTSM. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. Here again, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. All right, Melissa, are you ready? This week, go to El Paso, Inc. and find the latest in El Paso business news. The director of El Paso's architecture school, architectural school talks about growing up amidst Civil War in Texas Tech's architecture program and falling in love with El Paso and more in this week's Q&A. That's a lot going on there. Yeah. Catch up with former Border Patrol Chief and Congressman Sylvester Reyes in an interview with El Paso, Inc. He talks about border security, the books he's writing, and grandchildren and more. The best of El Paso results are in. Check out everything from donuts to doctors and much, much more. I want donuts. <laughs> You're getting near lunchtime here by... I met yeah. one of the winners yesterday. Oh, even cooler. All right, El Paso's business journal, El Paso Inc., is available for home or business delivery. To receive El Paso Inc., order it online at elpasoinc.com. Taking one product from where it is to where it needs to go. It's a basic idea, but the pandemic has disrupted the global supply chain. That's what's left, that, that's left all of us to settle for what's available or possibly go without. This Sunday on ABC7 Extra, host Saul Sines looks at the supply chain shortage from the Borderlands point of view. Hey, Ruben, you still there? Still here. There he is. I want to know from the insider viewpoint, what's it like to drive a Jeep up to Mount Crystal Ray? to the top scary <laughs> <laughs> say the least hair raising say the least. <laughs> i was yeah. i was in one twice once with you and i think i think your dad drove the other time and we put one of those in the video the, the other time i was with leon and every time i i do something really weird like right a, the faa tramway which i did i look through the viewfinder of a camera and say i'm okay it's on tv <laughs> but in reality <laughs> I was bumping along with you, and the people are grabbing the sides of the of the mountain, to, and they're almost getting run over on their toes. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for a whole lot of people. Uh, is that ever? Is that? Really, I guess that road is what you're ever going to get, right? 
that's pretty much it. You know, I think we've looked at uh, widening the road a little bit, but it's been it's been the same thing. You know that uh, you know it just uh, we've 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 done what we've had to do, and and that's pretty much it. So the trail itself, that up. you know, it allows for the jeeps to go up there and back down. Of course, two jeeps can't pass each other, so there's certain points that you know, we have to know the the area to be able to meet the jeep coming down if you're going up, and you know, and vice versa. So we. You know, so we have to, I think it's experience. You know, I've been driving up that mountain probably, I'd say, a good 20 years, maybe 25 years. And and for me, I didn't have a choice. You know, Dad said, hey, grab that Jeep and follow me up. You know, no. I, like, well, hey, you know <laughs> I need to. I, need to, I remember you know, hearing the road. I remember hearing you lost one over the side once. Yeah, we've lost actually two. Early on, there was a, an accident right there by Monsignor where one of the volunteers, the original volunteer, Mr. Barraza, went off the side, and he was actually paralyzed from that accident. Oh, wow. You know, I hear that remnants are still down there, and I I used to see him, but you can't see him anymore. I don't know what happened to him. Um, probably just uh, disintegrated or something with that metal rust and stuff. And then the other one was on the backside of the of the actual uh, last turn up at the top, and, and uh, you know, the uh, driver was coming up, and he got too close to the edge, and the wheel went off, so instead of stopping and trying to back up or trying to do something, uh, he jumped out of the Jeep and the Jeep went all the way to the bottom. Oh, so. Well, it's hazardous indeed, but, but also the, uh, the picture we have of, uh, the top that, uh, talk about how that crown came about. Cause that was not originally, uh, constructed till what time? The nineties. Yeah, that was in 1989, 89. Uh, Eighty-nine for the fiftieth anniversary. That was part of the original drawing and, and the original uh, vision that uh, that Soler had and and uh, and Costa, but they had never finished it again. You know the lack of money, so they uh, you know we we undertook that that uh, project in nineteen eighty nine for the fiftieth anniversary. We had a we had a, a telethon on KCOS, and you know we uh, raised money to build that crown so that was added uh, you know after 50 years that it was built yeah it, it seems like you've always had an issue with money because i'm reading back to an article from 1939 that was that bernie found for me last night um and he was talking about that also there's supposed to be 150 no excuse me there was supposed to be 150 car parking lot which we talked about a oh. power plant um and then flags from 21 nations were supposed to float on the summit also some of the other things have just never quite i guess gotten done because of lack of funds i wonder what that right. was what was that like or do you, do you were you there uh having no crown at the top because now you kind of lean on that as a wall oh yeah there was nothing to lean on you could walk up there and just you know kind of stand around the bottom and people would you know switch out you know uh in and out but there was nothing to keep you from from falling off, you know, and, and, and you know, people had accidents back then, you know, and, uh, and it was, uh, it was something that really made a difference, you know, and of course, being that it was part of, part of the original drawings and, and the idea, you know, that when we built that crown in 89, it had lights, it had conduit underneath mm -hmm. every, every point of that crown on top had a, 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 a huge light attached that would light it up and it was connected to the generator that was installed down at the bottom. And that didn't last very long, you know, that they went up there and they stole the wire. They even pulled the wire out of the conduits, you know, and, yeah. and stole the generator. Wow. You know, it took a it took a helicopter to put that generator up there uh, and drop it into the bunker that was built, the cement encased bunker. And, you know, who knows how they how they took it out. You know, but they stole the, the, the generator. Ruben, I have a question for you on it. I know that in the same article, they're mentioning that Uribe worked with electric drills and air hammers and had to have quite a large uh, compressor to do something like that. Do you know how they got that equipment up there? Was that initially hauled up or was it vehicle that took it up? Yeah, that was, that was hauled up there as well. That was hauled up there. Some of the photos that we found have some of the power plant that was actually mounted on, on wheels and they would pull it up. Uh, there was a little tractor, a little bulldozer, um, a small, small bulldozer that someone had donated, uh, you know, for the use up there. And that's what they moved a lot of the equipment for with. Yeah. Cause those old air hammers, this were heavy and big too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, our next picture is a, uh, closer up, more close up shot of the monument itself. And it, the, uh, when Solaire carved that, he made a perspective on that. And as an artist, you would know, 
if you if you were up there looking straight on with a drone, it would look very different than if you were looking at it. it tell, uh, Roberto, talk about the perspective. It's kind of like called foreshortening, so that when you see it, you know, the way it's rendered, it's rendered so that you can actually see it and bring it in a little closer to you. Uh, and that's something that a lot of artists do. So he was, he was um, trying to create the illusion of seeing it as a whole. And that's one of the things that I think artists do. Uh, there's also, when I was out there doing some restoration on the monument, they built scaffolding. I noticed that there is uh, his mother's name and his wife's name on the actual collar up here that oh. nobody sees. And then on the top of the cross, there is also a message that says, I believe, Salve. Is that oh. correct, Ruben? Salve. 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 Yep, that's it. Right. I, I shot that from an airplane. I figured that out one day. And Ruben has an interesting story about some else who was restoring it or working on it but he i guess you want to tell that story Ruben, about erasing the solaris signature <laughs> they thought it was yeah, we, had, we had some volunteers uh mm -hmm. and they were water patrolmen that, that volunteered up there to help us and they were uh, uh they were doing some cleanup work and stuff and that and that limestone is very very easy to work very pliable so they you know the vandals get up there and they start carving into the into the stone itself and and put their names and, you know, so-and-so was here and whatever else. So they went up there and what we would do to remove those, those names and stuff, the writing on it was we would take sandpaper and sand it down so you couldn't see it. Well, we had one of the border patrolmen on the scaffolding, you know, uh, cleaning that up. And, you know, he went to town sanding everything down. Oh. He erased the, the signature of Soler. Oh my find goodness. On that bottom right. <laughs> well, talk about for a minute, the, uh, in, it, the, the, total integration of that that monument with smelter town and of course asarka was the glue that paid for anybody that lived there to to work but the people were all catholic now here's something that uh most people may not realize that is not a crucifix no do you know what it, it is? is not it is christ the redeemer and he has his hands out but he's not nailed to the to the cross and I, I, I talked to a guy who'd been going up there for 60 years and he argued with me. I said, well, go take a look at a picture and it's not a crucifix. So that's an interesting piece of the puzzle, but how, how that all fit in with, with the smelter town experience. I mean, it was, it was integral with the people. Yeah, I think well, that was it. You know, Lourdes Costa was the, you know, the one that had the vision and he's the one that, that got the congregation, you know, uh, presented the idea and got the congregation to start working on it and he's the one that, that led you know the, the the efforts to to build it you know it was his his idea so the people there and, and i i remember I, I i had told you uh, about one of my uh uncles uh tony escandon who he was um you know an altar boy at the time and and he remembers you know he remembered the you know the the actual date when he was you know they were uh, kids but he w remembers um, Monsignor Costa telling the, the altar boys that he was going to put a cross up there at the top of the mountain, and they and they told him that he was crazy. Ah. And, and it, they said uh, he had a vision. Said, well, he says I'm going to put it up there. He says you watch. And sure enough, you know there was a whole thing. You know that Sunday that he got the people after church, he told them to bring, you know, work clothes and and you know be ready to to build a cross. And they built the first cross, which was a wooden 12 foot wooden cross. And, and then the next Sunday, they made the, the, the climb straight up the mountain to erect that cl the cross on the top. And that was the first monument, the first cross that was actually you know, built up there. And then in the uh, metal shop at Asarco, they replaced it with a metal one at some right. point early on. So yeah, I mean, that was the vocational school that we had talked about yeah. earlier, that they, they're the ones that built that metal cross. And it was a 25-foot cross that they had uh, replaced that wooden one. And there was no road back then at that point. Nope, there wasn't still. You know, so Can they, you they imagine? They, up straight, up the, straight up the mountain. He recruited the whole community because uh, my mom talked about stories that her and her young friends were teenagers or something of that age. Uh, they would take cement, sand, whatever they needed in little buckets so that they can get close and, and have that mixture. So they, they were contributing materials or taking materials up the hill. All the kids. All the kids, adults. Yeah. So it was a big community effort. Very interesting story. We're going to come back and wrap it up. Talk about a video that occurred 
on the end of that. You got something to say on the way uh, out? I found uh, Barbara Given Bainey just sent me a link for the cemetery with the names of the people that are buried there. Now, how accurate it is after this time. Because some woman is asking her parents removed, her grandparents removed. She doesn't know where to find them. So I'm sending her to the diocese. But I'll print, put that link up. Fair enough. Taking a break here. Back in a moment. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. Monterey Asset Management is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, maybe you should invest in real estate. Monterey Asset manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the new website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation of investing in real estate, call certified property manager Ray Baca, 915-592-4549, 592-4549. Panera believes in saying yes to the good things. Yes to mac and cheese. Yes to topping it with cheesy Parmesan crisps. And yes to putting it all on a sandwich. The new grilled mac and cheese sandwich. Get $1 delivery when you order on the app. Panera, live your yes. Restrictions apply. Hey, El Paso and surrounding areas, are you ready for some savings? Ivan Ochoa, general manager from Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Fiat. Right now, we are paying top dollar for all trades, plus 0% financing for 72 months on several models. There's never been a better time to trade or upgrade for less. During Jeep Adventure Days, Sunland Park, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat will take any trade in any condition, regardless of make or model, car, truck, or SUV. We want it, even if you owe up to $10,000 more than your old car is worth, so you can drive home a new or certified pre-owned vehicle for less, save thousands in interest with zero APR for 72 months. Plus, save thousands at the all-new Sun Park Dodge Certified Pre-Owned Super Center. Our inventory of cars, trucks, and SUVs has never been better. All military personnel and all first responders receive an additional discount. Thank you for your service. Sun Park Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, Ram, Fiat. We're buying a car. It's fun. At I-10 at Sun Park Drive or online at SunlandParkDodge.com. Estamos en tu esquina, El Paso. El Paso Strong. Includes factory rebate and dealer discount plus TTNL. Zero APR is thirteen seventy two per thousand finance. On select vehicles with approved credit. Offers not combined. Radio advertising can connect your business with holiday shoppers wherever they go. Use iHeart Ad Builder to create an affordable custom radio ad right on your phone. Just click, listen, approve, then hear it on the radio. Create your customized ad today at iHeartAdBuilder.com. Good Risings. The Good Risings podcast is a collection of six mini shows curated to give you a daily shot of inspiration, motivation, humor, relationship advice, and even astrology. You can choose to listen to one or all of the daily Good Risings offerings available on our feed. It's the perfect daily practice for anyone looking to lead a more intentional, mindful, and inspired life. Listen to the Good Risings podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. News Radio 690 KTSM. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. Here again, El Paso History with Melissa Sargent and Jackson Polk. I want to quickly let you know that the McGoffin Home State Historic Site is open and they are posting their pro pro programming schedules on Facebook. But they also have Friday, October 29th, 7 p.m. to midnight, a McGoffin Home Evening Tour. So check that out. Call them up, 533 Five one four seven. Oh, and I wanted to say so we had some people that uh, were on Facebook. I wanted to say hello to. We had Marge, Margie uh, Benton's on. You're listening. We've got uh, Valerie Provencio. She's an archaeologist. Uh, Margie, or oh, there she is. Lisa Agon Neighbors. She's wondering where Ruben is. <laughs> and Barbara Given Bainey, of course. Marshall Carter. Some great people out there. And we also had uh, some comments over on. Uh, where did I go with it? YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, that's where I'm looking. Oh, no, just check, check them out yourself. Yeah. 
and yeah, check them out. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time here, Ruben. Your last thoughts on all this, because uh, uh, we did do a video up there, and I want to put that sh uh, picture up. It's number sixteen, and that is an actual television recording that I made. I just got the camera set up just in time because as the moon was setting, it came right across the back of the, the figure. And that's the first usable frame I could use. And then it went downhill for about six minutes. That's actually bonus material. That entire moon set behind the, the figure is in bonus material on that DVD. And that's that that's online for free as well. So a beautiful uh, photograph. It, 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 it's fabulous. And people th think I made it up. I did not. So Ruben, you're, you're, we got about a minute. I don't know how much time I have, but about a minute. Uh, you summarize what you see here because. It's a fabulous experience to know the history of a Sarko intertwined with Smelter Town and intertwined with Chris Ray. It's one big story. It is. It is. And there's so much, you know, there's so much that still is, un is untold. You know, I, um, the history and the, and the research that I always do and, and you know, take the time to, to uh, read and, and talk to people. You know, just this past Thursday, I, I did a wedding. And it just so happened that this family was from Smelter Town. And the dad, the, the groom's dad got up and he came over and he said hi to me. And I, I've known the gentleman for many, many years. And all of a sudden he just started talking about Mount Cristo Rey. And, you know, he says, hey, I've been wanting to talk to you. And I said, well, you know, call me. I said, you, you can find me anywhere. Tell your kids to get a hold of me. So he says, yeah. He says, you know, uh, you know, I, I used to hang out with, uh, with Tom Lee and, and his brother. Did you know about a brother that Tom Lee had? Uh, yeah, he had the, uh, and a son. Uh, we're, we're about gone here. Put out your phone number to find you. 915-252-9840. That's Ruben Escandone. All right. We, Roberto, we got 30 seconds here. Hey, thanks for doing this. I think sure. El Paso needs to know and beyond uh, what's been going on here. And there's a wonderful interest available to people to continue finding out about smelters. We need that sugar daddy to build a museum. Absolutely. And we got a ton of artifacts, and Ruben knows where they are. Uh, Rene yep. Ornelas has them down in the valley. Uh, Ruben, we need a museum, dude, don't we? We do. We do need one. Even if they don't let the, that building on site be the museum, we need something else. Melissa, we're gone. Be here next week. Fair enough. See you then. And Andrew thank Polk, you. thank you for all your help in there. Monday oh, yeah. through Friday, talk El Paso. He is the man on 4 to 5 p.m. on uh, 690 KTSM. We'll see you next week. Next week. Thank you for listening to the El Paso History Show. We hope you'll join us again next Saturday morning, 10 to noon, and be sure to tell a friend about us. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Legacy Real Estate Services, 915-585-7777. By Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the one and only Margarita. By Keystone Heritage Park on Donovan Drive, 915-584-0563. By Monterey Asset Management. By Mission Del Rey, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs and gift shopping. And by State Farm Agent Ralph Dickerson, 581-0000. Thank you for joining us from the studios of News Radio 690 KTSM AM, El Paso. What's all the buzz about nasal irrigation?